Shall we start? Yes, sir. Visible, sir. Visible, audible. Okay, fine. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think uh, this topic was something which is actually offshoot of uh, Dr. Pali Raman's talk on uh, CBC. I mean, one of the comments which came from his talk was that that could be something similar in newborn. I mean, unfortunately, each and I, I thought talking just about hemogram and newborn is going to be boring for everybody. So I tried to integrate, kind of bring in all the common tests which we tend to do. So I've chosen seven common ones. Please remember that each one of them can be discussed for about 25 minutes or 20 30 minutes. So I'm going to be in a bit of a rush, but I would be happy to discuss any queries which comes through. Now, my idea is really not to give numbers and then say, is it more or less? What I'm trying to do is to develop a framework. Okay. And then try to interpret some of the common blood tests. Now, one of the problems with newborn is that we all know that they are no longer a miniature adult. So the interpretation of tests is very different when compared to when, when we compare to the sorry, when we compare to adults. Now, the reason for that are many. First is we have a gestation related physiological immaturity. Um, can, can you hear me properly? I'm just wondering. Yeah, that's fine. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, fine. Um, so, and then we have the age related after the baby is born. There are a lot of physiological and anatomical changes which keep happening. And on top of it, when we have many coexisting illnesses, all these put together make interpretation of neonatal uh, newborn tests very difficult. Now, because it's about interpretation, I don't know how many of you can interpret this particular picture. Um, I know we cannot interact directly. So, if you got this right, and I'll tell you why this is important. Okay. So, okay. So, we interpret our own test in our own way. Now, that brings us to the question, what is normal? Now, how often... We have uh, done tests and then given it to the mothers and then the parent comes back with the test of a newborn child. I mean, one week old coming into the OPD, we, let us say we do a bilirubin, bilirubin comes back as 10, mother comes in a big panic and then we look at it and then say, no, no, it's okay. And then by the side of that uh, test, actually, the normal range is given, one less than 2 milligram or less than 2.5 milligram. And then the moment we say normal, the mother looks at as though we do not know how to interpret, isn't it? And how I'm sure many of us have faced such a situation. Now, what is normal? I mean, this has been a statement which has been made from one of the cartoon characters from Adams family, Marticia Adams. I, this was way back in 1933, and it holds good even today. Normal is just an illusion. What is normal for the spider is chaos for the fly. And I think it very much illustrates what happens in a newborn. Because what's a normal baby? We can say a 2.8 kg term baby is normal. And again, term, is it a 37 week, 38, 39, 40? We don't know. So we need to think about, or is it a preterm normally? A preterm, let's say 28 week, 1.8 kg, definitely is not normal. But we land up doing a lot of tests and then we do manage to interpret them and we do treat. So what we really have to keep in mind is we don't pass a, a test as normal or abnormal. What we need to do is, is it on the farther end of the reference range? So if you take, let's say, 100 babies of a particular gestation or a particular age and then try to plot them in a curve, this is what we are going to get. We are going to get a bell-shaped curve and that bell-shaped curve uh, is going to give us, sorry, an extremes which is between the 50, which is less than the fifth centile or more than the 95th centile. And we need to think about, okay, that's the age where which I might have to do something about it. Okay, that is maybe clinically because it will, might have an impact and I need to do something about it. Now, my framework is about something which you can look at. Okay, it's about chasing chambermaids. 
but really not. Okay, so but if you think veteran gentleman first, you attract a chambermaid. That happens a lot of instances, but that's not the framework I'm thinking about. I'm talking more in terms of validity, gestational age, a framework, and a clinical condition. So whenever I have a test, I need to look at those things: a validity, a gestational age, a postnatal age, and the coexisting clinical conditions. Those we need to bring in before we try to interpret any of the tests. And this is the framework which I will be going through in all the, the further tests which you are going through. When I talk about validity by itself, what do I mean by it? So think of about the sample. Okay, what type of sample I'm going to take? How do I take the sample? Is it going to be from a heel prick? Is it a very puncture sample? Is it an arterial puncture sample? For example, if you look at a newborn screening, they invariably want a heel stick sample and not a very puncture sample because they say their values are skewed because the whole test is calibrated for a, for a heel stick and not for a venipuncture or arterial stick. And then the next question which comes is how did, what type of bottle we use, what type of media we used. Okay, it really matters because let's say again, if you if you don't use a sodium fluoride tube for a glucose, you're in glucose testing, it will be invariably low. And then the next question is how did we transport it? Okay, some tests need to be transported immediately to the lab. Some tests tend to be to be transported in a uh, um, cold uh, media, for example, in a cold uh, temperature, for example, ammonia, lactate. Because otherwise, you send the lab, one hour later, you get a report which is invariably high. And then the next question is, how is the lab is going to analyze? What type of analysis they are going to do? And what methodology they are going to follow? That matters a lot before we can pass judgment on if the test is normal or not. Okay, so the test which I'm going to look at right now is about seven of them I've taken. So hemoglobin, and which is the most common and the most widely um, ad ordered test in any of the neonatal units. We look a little bit about the WBC count because it comes along with it, but a lot of us don't even look at it. And then a probably more relevant one is the neutrophil count and then the platelet, glucose, bilirubin and thyroid function. I'm happy to discuss interpretation of any of the other tests if necessary, if you have somebody is interested. Okay, think about it. We have got a term baby who was delivered following uh, an aunt, my mother had after so we decided well, the obstetrician decided to go ahead and do a cesarean section. And then uh, our enthusiastic duty doctor decides to go and then do a hemoglobin for this child at six hours of age. Okay, I got a hemoglobin of 12.2. Now, and then that value also gives now, should I bother about this or not? Now, when I want to think about hemoglobin itself, <coughs> I'm more interested in why do I want to do this test? I'm this basically because I want to study the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Now, blood hemoglobin concentration, which is what we all order, talks about an amount of hemoglobin in the whole blood. Now, please remember, hemoglobin is not lying just like that, and it's in the RBCs. So, and the problem when we assess hemoglobin is that in extremes, both in lower end and higher end, because we have a lot of heart disease and may not be that much number of uh, reduced hemoglobin, usually it is for, it, it doesn't give us an accurate representation of the oxygen carrying capacity. And that's why people came up with the next alternative, which is the hematocrit, which basically is a volume percentage of RBCs. And in newborns, because there are not very many conditions which affect the mean hemoglobin concentration, uh, sorry, mean corpuscular hemoglobin, MCH. So hematocrit probably is a more relevant uh, test than hemoglobin itself in a newborn period. But having said that, most of us are more comfortable with hemoglobin and that's what we tend to use. Now, when I want to look at a hemoglobin, again, I need to know, is it an arterial sample, venous sample or a capillary sample? Because arterial sample is probably the best accuration of accurate representation of the uh, oxygen carrying capacity because it's from where the, the uh, blood goes straight into the various organs. Venus basically is a return. And so if we are going to have a peripheral cooling, we might, or if there is a lot of edema conditions like in sepsis, where there is edema, where there is leak, plasma leakage, your venous hematocrit can be higher. And capillary um, Hemo hemoglobin is in I mean, capillary sample hemoglobin will invariably be 
either low or high because if you have a condition where there is low peripheral perfusion your hemoglobin can be either low or high depending upon where you sample and again the tissue edema also can affect the picture so it is better not to look at a capillary hemoglobin and of course there is going to be an impact of gestation post gestation postnatal age and clinical condition i'll talk about a little bit about it so what happens to the hemoglobin and gestation age so look at here so you could see that um the norm this is about the 50th centile so again obviously that i'm not talking about 95th of the fifth centile so the 50th centile you look at the average hemoglobin for a 22 to 23 week it starts at 14 grams and then it keeps going up with every gestation and then by about term it reaches about 17 17.5 but then it tends to drop off to 17.2 so yes so there is a gradual increase and then it comes out this is just with gestation age on day 0 of life and same thing you could see with the hematocrit also whereas when you look at the 50th and 50th centile it drops down to the 30th to 40th 40 42 depending upon again the gestation age and again for the higher end because we can have and the children who have polycythemia again it goes starts from 50 and goes as high as 70 sorry 68 69 and then look at what the impact of age so in though most babies have a huge amount of hemoglobin they start with a lot of hemoglobin invariably the hemoglobin pass uh, levels comes down as the child gets older and it can go down to as low as 7.5 for by about 6 to 7 weeks of age and that happens with all babies and the more preterm are they are the the drop is even lower there are a lot of reasons why it happens but as for term babies usually doesn't drop below 9 so we need to keep all that when we want to handle a child with a low hemoglobin so in the first 12 hours of age as you could see the numbers here anything less than 12 we should be bothered if the child is ventilated or needing oxygen but otherwise it's not jump in to give hemo uh, blood for back cells for these babies so anything less than 10 is when the first 24 hours is when we might need to consider transfusing for babies beyond that uh it if we still stick to less than 10 and from day 15 onwards we find that if the baby is on oxygen we might go to less than 8.5 and it does not need any supplemental oxygen we can even wait uh, to less than 7.5 i personally even wait to up to 6.5 actually i'm even more uh, conservative with regard to blood transfusions because i'm more worried about the complications of blood transfusion okay so for a term baby again the same numbers hold good for uh, again less than 12 if the child is very sick and less than 10 if the child is reasonably sick is and then unless the child is symptomatic just don't jump into give transfusion for a baby because the risk of uh, transfusion is lot worse than the disease itself so coming back to that child which we looked at so it's basically the lower reference of normal age as of now i will not be bothered to intervene okay but let's look at it from a third week the same value 11.2 but a third week but at, on ventilator for rds i would have to it's still on the lower reference the range but because i think that the oxygen firing capacity of the baby is con, uh, con compromised i would have to consider giving blood transfusion whereas the same third week at four weeks of age 7.3 grams again it would go and for that age it will be still on the lower reference range but this time i'm not going to do anything because the child is otherwise well and that's what we need to come so one it's not a question of one size fits for all you have to look at the age the gestation and the coexisting clinical condition of the child before making an uh, any treatment decision now if you consider this some another baby a term baby who was delivered to infant or diabetic mother hemoglobin of 24.2 Hematocrit of sixty nine point four, twenty four hours of age. What should we do? This is a polycythemia, obviously, isn't it? It's well about. So if you look at it, I'm just because running short of time, I'm not going to discuss in detail. But what we need to say is, if the child is symptomatic, any hematocrit more than sixty five, you would do a partial exchange transfusion. But if the child is asymptomatic, till they go beyond seventy five, you will not do anything. So in that child, we shouldn't really be bothered to. uh treat because it's only 69.4 so moving on to the next test which we all do okay 
we all get in the test <coughs> wbc count come baby count comes as 15000 24 hours of life my wife looks at it and then she says you oh 15000 you have to take because she is a physician so she she has to pay now if you look at the 50th centile for a wbc count it starts at about 3.5 3500 and you can go as high as about 11 to 12 uh, thousand for a term baby but please remember that in isolation the total white cell count is a pretty useless test and on top of it one of the common problems we face with our automated counters is that um they tend to uh calculate uh, cal i mean identify nucleated rbc basically because pre term babies newborns tend to have or even pre terms tend to have a lot of nucleated rbcs they get counted as wbcs so in fact you will see a count of 30000 40000 it's probably because you got immature rbcs and not because this child really has a leukocytosis but please remember that if a newborn has a leukopenia if i find that total count is 2500 i am lot more worried than account of 25 or even 30000 so this child for a term baby i'm not too bothered 15000 i'm happy and said okay fine just don't bother now look at let us look at the next test which probably we should look more often when we don't because you no know, it's given as a percentage your total cell count is given as 10000 the beautiful count is given as 20 30 or 40% we don't even bother to look at the absolute beautiful count all you need to do is calculate the percentage of your total uh, leukocyte count and you'll get your absolute total count which is a relative i mean number because we need to actually if you really want to do it you have to do the absolute total count but we don't do it more often than not but looking at it so a term baby 2800 cell count at 24 hours of life so this is what happens with a term baby okay so normally you have a you you'll start with about 10000 cells and then you can go up as high as 14 15000 for a term and then can drop down whereas for a preterm it starts at about 4500 and then again same thing which happens with age now if you want to comment about it there are two charts which you use actually and then see again you can see then 9th to the 90th percentile so for a preterm we use something called the mozin mozin ho chart and for the term babies we use the mandro chart so anything which falls between these two ranges we are not too bothered we are happy with it but if it goes outside then we need to worry so for that baby going back 2800 cell count lower is it's actually below the fifth centile so this child i'll be worried this child i'll have to think what is the reason maybe this child has got sepsis maybe not but if it's 34 weeker 2800 i'm more than happy because it's within the normal range and that is why i keep repeating we have to think about validity gestational age postnatal age and of course the coexisting condition now another common test which often we look at and then we find uh, every much uh, worried about this is the prenatal count again a term baby baby day 5 comes with a bit of bleeding okay we decide to do a bit of hemogram find that the prenatal count comes as 128000 and again at 24 hours of life now the question is should we do anything about it now if you look at the gestation prenatal count and gestation age we find that most the normal count starts at 2, 2 lakhs that's why you know we cannot use the adult value of 1.5 lakhs and then say a baby is thrombocytopenic or not we actually right now the definition of thrombocytopenia has gone up to 2 lakhs but see what happens it then keeps going up and for a term baby it could be the normal value is as high as 2.7 lakhs this is the pretty simple and what happens to the effect the age so you actually find that about the second week and uh, at the two to three weeks and again at six weeks there is actually a raise in the platelet count for whatever reason we don't know and then of course there are nadis but whatever happens more normal babies usually tend to have counts definitely more than 2 lakhs now the question is okay should we then jump in to treat any baby who has got a less than normal or less than less than the fifth centile and the answer is no because even though you might have less than the fifth centile uh, platelet count they don't have a clinical implication so when do we actually interfere so unless the blood uh, the platelet count is less than 25000 we don't need to bother about doing anything about it you just give to give a platelet uh, only when it is less than 25000 if it is 25 to 50 and we have got a sick neonate then consider giving it 
and unless we go for a major surgery we don't treat any platelet less than 1 lakh and this is something which we have to keep in mind when we manage a child with platelet count so again in this case yeah it's low range but i'm not going to grade i'll sit on it so i don't know how many of you is going to get it right can anybody interpret if not okay idu vandu naan pidichu mosalukku unga and that's what happens okay it's why now it's a way we look at things when it comes to interpreting any newborn test so we have to have a framework to do it now the next one which you had to look at is something which uh, i got only three more to go so should finish very fast so um glucose which we do all the time term baby well baby blood glucose we have done it at eight hours of age okay and then uh, because child looks bit jittery and then we got a blood sugar of 38 and we all know that uh, blood Uh, sorry glucose is a uh, energy for organ function so we need to remember that why it is important for all our babies because we know that ba babies need uh, glucose because they got a very big brain unlike us so and then and brain can use only glucose so and of course babies unfortunately cannot maintain a great response if there is a drop in the blood sugar so when we want to look at glucose there are so many limitations and that's what we need to keep in mind so again as i said something similar to the oxygen carry capacity the best sample to get would be an arterial sample but unfortunately we cannot be poking every baby for for this is artery in for a blood glucose so venous is not very representative and capillary is very much depend on the blood flow peripheral blood flow and if you want to do a uh, whole blood that's another important factor which comes in that is to looking at the whole blood cell and whole blood and plasma and please remember plasma glucose is always about 7% higher than the whole blood the best way of doing uh, assessing blood sugar is to do the exokinetic method which basically we cannot do it i mean we send it to the lab and they takes a good 4 to 6 hours for us to get results by them to be either sick or better okay so we all of us tend to use the bedside region uh, strips but please remember it only deducts about 85% of the cases and there is a false high and about 14000 it gives a false positive so whenever you find a very significantly low um, blood glucose we need to send it to the lab for confirmation and while sending to it we have to make sure that we have taken sodium chloride a sample you know sorry cup bottle and also send to the lab as soon as possible and processing has to happen within an hour otherwise you are invariably your blood glucose will be low now i talked a little bit about what happens to the blood glucose and the postnatal age so invariably when see at birth our umbilical flow gets cut off i mean the placental blood flow is get cut off so your blood sugar falls and once the blood sugar falls it can fall as low as even 28 30 but then the body baby main body main uh, mounts a counter regulatory mechanism and then so your blood sugar starts rising so by about 3 to 4 hours it should come back to what we call as an operational threshold of about more than 50 okay and what is this operation there because we just don't know what is the true value what is the normal value what is the 19th 50th centile or 50th centile and people have found that the, at these values uh, the risk of a neurological injury is very less and it also makes sure that babies can be we have time to manage these babies effectively so for asymptomatic term neonate less than 36 mg should be in the first 24 hours is taken as the operational guideline for beyond for 24 hours it is more less than 47 and that pretty much holds good for everybody else so this may be 38 mg it is on the lower reference range so how would we manage this baby all we need to do is continue breastfeeding probably if the baby is not very keen on sucking try to express some breast milk and then give if nothing comes then consider substitute nutrition don't quote me on that all we try to do is to still breastfeed 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 and ebm okay and then check the blood sugar concentration before subsequent uh, feeds it's it's important to check before feed and not after feed till the babe, at least you have three values which are within the norm above the operational guideline and if the blood glucose continues to be low then you have to consider intravenous glucose and one important uh, thing about while giving intravenous fluid is continue enter feeds continue breastfeeding or express milk If of course the baby is symptomatic or if it's one of those at risk neonates, babies who got a lot of, uh, I mean, preterm babies, babies who are uh, asphyxiated, babies who are IUGR, babies infant or diabetic, but those kind of babies, those babies who we need to be a lot more careful 
we might have to start with intravenous glucose 10%. And unless the baby is having seizures or is really in the infanting hemodynamic compromise, I personally don't like giving mini boluses because the moment you give a mini bolus, yes, it improves the blood glucose, but also stimulates insulin production. And actually, you get a rebound hypoglycemia. So it's better not to give it. And our blood, blood glucose concentration should be guiding our rate of infusion. We need to calculate the glucose infusion rate. And once the baby is stable, we can start feeding these babies. Again, another one more. Anybody to think about? So, this is what we know about Tarpura Vasana. This is something which uh, uh, Batsa talked about just now about bilirubin. So, in a term baby, well baby, 89 hours of food, so almost 4 and 5 days, 16 milligram per deciliter, well baby. So, what to do about it? Please remember that most babies tend to develop jaundice. So, I don't, we don't need to worry too much about the jaundice by itself. It's only at very high levels, they are at a risk of bilirubin encephalopathy or carnic risk. Of course, gun interest can happen even with lower at lower levels in babies who have got risk factors and in preterm babies. So we all know that invariably babies uh, irrespective of gestation age, the bilirubin continues to increase and then it uh, decreases. So for a term baby, it will peak by about three to five days, and for a preterm, it will be five to seven days, and then it comes down to uh, by seven to ten days in term and ten to fourteen days in preterm. Okay. Now, most important thing about doing a bilirubin estimation is to make sure that you don't have a hemolyzed sample because almost all the tests which we do use tend to use a spectrophotometry, so which tends to absorb more uh, light and as a result, you get a falsely high bilirubin value. So, transcutaneous bilirubinometer, which is becoming famous these, these days, is only useful as a screening tool and it is not useful when the baby has... Uh, 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 once we start the baby on phototherapy. So we can use uh, in your, uh, as a point of care test, we can use a spectro photo, a spectrophotometry in the unit itself or send it to the labs which can either use a diazo method or enzyme method. Of this enzyme method is probably the most accurate of the lot, but not many places have it. Please remember that when you get a high value, just don't uh, try to debate and then uh, uh, find out if the value is correct or not. Start treatment and then always send one more sample to find out if the treatment if it's a wrong value or not. Now, bilirubin is, as we all know, is interpreted based on the age of the child. Now, the best way of doing it is use to bilirubin nomograms. There are a lot of nomograms. This is basically adapted from the nice guidelines we use. Of course, now we I have developed a bit more. So I have developed and my own app, which we use in my unit. I'm happy to share with people. So it's not on, it's an Android app. Okay. So it basically you just fill in the data, it gives you what we have to do. So I've done that for this baby. So what it, 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 this app is based on both the American Academy of Pediatrics and the NICE guidelines. Um, so it starts from 23 weeks and goes on to 42 weeks. So you could, uh, it basically tells me that as of now, you don't need to intervene, but because there is a risk of increasing bilirubin, you repeat it after 12, 24 hours and then see if it's still the child needs it or not. Okay. So, Last one, I think, yeah, this is the last one. So, very often we tend to have mothers, I mean, we, nowadays we do newborn screening for most babies and then we get values. And uh, I find a lot of babies being put on um, uh, l even at values um, of 12, 15. So, is it something which is acceptable? And this sample was taken at 24 hours of age. Um, it is important that we need to prevent higher uh, congenital hypothyroidism. I mean, there's no doubt about it because it's the most commonest treatable cause of mental retardation, easily treatable and fairly easily diag uh, diagnosed by a simple test. And when we look at screening, what we do is a TSH-based screening, whereas the European countries tend to do a TSH and a T4-based screening. But please remember that TSH is a, one of the stress hormones in the babies. So what happens is soon after birth, the TSH level actually shoots up. So it could easily from three to four, it could easily go up to 15, 20. So if we do a test, let's say by two, on day one, day two, and day three, we very often tend to get some falsely elevated uh, TSH levels. So if you want to do, ideally we should do either a card sample and preferably with a heel prick. 
when we want to do do a ebna sample we could take a cord uh, cord blood but beyond that we shouldn't really be doing a ebna sample and as i said the test which we tend to do would be a tsh or if you are working in one of those places we can also do a free depo uh, please remember that you consider a tsh as post positive screening only if it is more than 20 and some centers even use more than 25 micro units or milli units per mm now uh, so anything like 12 14 which in an adult will consider as significant is not considered as significant any more if the tsh is more than 50 uh, 50 then it's probably because the child has got a permanent congenital hypothyroidism whereas anything between 20 to 49 usually it's either a false positive or it's a transient hypothyroidism so in this child 16 very much in the normal reference range i'm not going to get to worry about so the last one so again it's interpretation yet sir kai kalikku udavade super super madam thank you interesting yeah. so i think uh, you are interpreting at least my cartoons fine so the take home message is whenever we look at a newborn test think about validity gestation um postnatal age and clinical condition of course the other part that you get to poninga i am not responsible so thank you very much for your patience i am happy to answer any questions